I'm actually convinced that there's no such thing as a true vitamin D toxicity problem. Now, what I'm not saying is that a person, if they take higher amounts of vitamin D, they won't get some symptoms, but the actual cause of those symptoms, I don't believe is coming from high doses of vitamin D3. I think it's coming from a deficiency of the cofactors for vitamin D, primarily from a magnesium deficiency and a vitamin K2 deficiency, and there's a couple others as well. Now, we know most people are deficient in magnesium going into this. So if you're not taking enough magnesium while you're taking vitamin D, I think you're going to start noticing some of the symptoms that people call vitamin D toxicity, which are irritability, insomnia, constipation, fatigue, muscle spasm or cramps, calcification, calcium that builds up, and arrhythmia. But there are also symptoms of low magnesium as well as symptoms of low vitamin K2. I mean, if you just look at the case studies or some of the studies of vitamin D toxicity, you don't normally see they're taking magnesium with it. They're not taking K2 with it. Many times they're taking vitamin D2, not D3 as well. Now, you don't want to take calcium when you're testing for vitamin D toxicity because the symptom is hypercalcemia, which is too much calcium in the blood. Why would you want to take calcium? It doesn't make sense. Now, I found something interesting on Wikipedia I want to share with you. It said, it is possible that some of the symptoms of vitamin D toxicity are actually due to vitamin K depletion. And they're talking about vitamin K2. And yeah, I think we already knew that. Vitamin K2 is needed to prevent the calcium from building up in the soft tissues. Vitamin D helps increase calcium absorption in the small intestine by 20 times. So now we have all this calcium in the blood. Vitamin K2 comes in there and takes it from the blood into the tissues, preventing buildup of soft tissue calcium. And also magnesium is one of the best antidotes to prevent kidney stones. The toxicity symptoms from vitamin D, I believe, are just lacking the cofactors. And the reason I'm even talking about this is that it's very important to take therapeutic doses of vitamin D to deal with certain conditions. Amount that's recommended by the Mayo Clinic is like 600 IUs. This is ridiculous. When you're out in the sun for about 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, you're going to get at least 20,000 IUs of vitamin D3. Now, why would the RDAs be only 600 IUs? And why would someone be nervous or concerned by taking a maintenance dosage of 10,000 IUs per day when you get 10,000 or 20,000 IUs just from being out in the sun? There is also some data out there. People will say that, well, once you get a certain amount of vitamin D from the sun, your body will just stop making vitamin D. I try to find that data. I couldn't find uh, any evidence that being true, but I did find an interesting research article on lifeguards in Israel. And what was interesting, unique about these lifeguards, that there was a 20 times increased risk of getting kidney stones, probably because they got a lot of vitamin D and they didn't have enough K2 or magnesium. Now, let's talk about vitamin D as far as the therapeutic dose for certain conditions especially autoimmune conditions. Dr. Combra from Brazil has an amazing protocol, I mean, with thousands of success stories. And he uses between 50,000 to 80,000 to 100,000 to up to 200,000 IUs of vitamin D3 to put these autoimmune cases in remission. And what he does is he just uh, monitors the parathyroid gland, right? Because the parathyroid gland controls calcium. So if you're low in calcium, the parathyroid gland will kind of make up the difference and raise up and start pulling calcium from your bone. So if your parathyroid hormone is high, that means you're low in calcium or low in vitamin D. And if your parathyroid hormone is low, that means you have enough calcium or you have enough vitamin D. And when you get into autoimmune diseases, you have this very unique situation. You may have normal amounts of vitamin D in the blood, but at the receptor, it's not really working for 
a whole number of reasons. What this doctor does is give you more vitamin D to penetrate through this resistance and also realize when they do a blood test for vitamin D, they're not measuring what's happening at receptor level. There is no agreed upon amount of vitamin D in the blood as a certain thing that everyone agrees on in the medical profession. In other words, the normal amounts of vitamin D in our blood are still uncertain. We don't really know. There's a very interesting book I just read by Dr. Harold Sheely. He's an ophthalmologist. This is what he said. Anything less than 150 nanograms per milliliter will likely not work because his focus was on the eye. And he would use higher doses of vitamin D to get great results, which is just quite fascinating. Now, you might say, well, if it works so great, why doesn't everyone know about it? Well, because it works so great. Even if you question vitamin D for various remedies, you get attacked. I won't be surprised if I get attacked for this video by other doctors on this topic, but I'm trying to give you all the data to think with it because... I think the danger is in the lack of the cofactors for vitamin D more than the D itself. Vitamin D is just really hard to get. You take a 70-year-old and a 20-year-old and you put them out in the sun for a period of time. The 70-year-old will get 75% less vitamin D because their skin is older. So number one, when you take vitamin D, also take magnesium, also take vitamin K2, also Boron is a cofactor for vitamin D and magnesium. Zinc is also another cofactor, very important. And lastly, vitamin A. Now that I talked about the toxicity, let's focus in on the therapeutic benefits of vitamin D from this video right here. Check it out.